Let's open up to Matthew chapter 20. We're going to be reading from verse 17. Uh, Pew Bibles, it's found on page 875. Here we go. While going up to Jerusalem, Jesus took the 12 disciples aside privately and said to them on the way, See, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, and crucified, and on the third day he will be raised. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons approached him with her sons. She knelt down to ask him for something. What do you want? he asked her. Promise, she said to him, that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right and the other on your left in the kingdom, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? We are able, they said to him. He told them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right and left is not mine to give. Instead, it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. When the ten disciples heard this, they became indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them over and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and those in high positions act as tyrants over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. As they were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. There were two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd demanded that they keep quiet, but they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Jesus stopped, called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, they said to him, open our eyes. Moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes. Immediately they could see, and they followed him. This is the word of the Lord. I am the greatest. I cannot be beaten. I am pretty. I am the king. Does anyone know who said those words? Muhammad Ali. He'd be one of the greatest athletes of all time, especially if you asked him. Muhammad Ali, the boxer, who was the undisputed heavyweight champion for most of the 70s, who defeated the best boxers that the world could throw at him. He was quick on his feet and he was quick with his mouth. He was not afraid to taunt and put down his opponents. He was not afraid to raise his own status by pointing out how great he was or how great he thought he was. He had an attitude that was all me, me, me. Look at me. I am the greatest. He trained hard and was rewarded for his effort. Now, this is an attitude that the world promotes, isn't it? The idea of self-glorification, of seeking status through your works, of lauding your greatness over others, of being rewarded for your efforts. Now we're working our way through the book of Matthew. Jesus has been teaching about the kingdom, about what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom. Today, Jesus points out what true greatness in the kingdom is, that it's not found in status or position, but in service and humbleness. We see in Jesus who the greatest truly is, we see in the disciples a wrong response to that greatness. And in two blind men, outsiders that Jesus brings in, we see a right response to greatness. So what will be our response? Let's pray. 
God, help us to come humbly to your word now. Help us to listen. Help us to understand your plan for the kingdom. Thank you for the spirit you've given us that works through us for your glory. We ask that you'd be with us now. Amen. So at point two, and for that we're going to jump to verse 17 to 19. Now we did cover these verses last week, but it's an important hinge passage. It links back to last week's passage where Jesus was warning about his, his disciples about self-righteousness and possessiveness. And it brings us into this week's passage because it immediately outlines who the greatest in the kingdom is and why. Let's look at it. Verse 17. While going up to Jerusalem, Jesus took the 12 disciples aside privately and said to them on the way, See, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, and crucified. And on the third day he will be raised. So the Son of Man... This is a title for Jesus that we heard in our uh, reading from Daniel today. He's the one who is given dominion and glory and a kingdom. The one whose dominion is everlasting, whose kingdom will not be destroyed. This is the greatest and this is Jesus. But let's look back again at verses 18 and 19 of Matthew as to how this greatness comes about. He's going to be brought down low first, handed over to those of authority within the Jewish community. This is an important detail to remember later. Be condemned to death and then absolutely humiliated, brought down to the lowest, a prisoner, mocked, treated unkindly, brutally flogged, killed in a barbaric, humiliating form of execution, a form that was reserved for slaves, criminals, and other despised people. How brought down, how humbled can you get? But then he will be raised. He'll be brought to his throne over the kingdom. He's the greatest. Do we fully grasp that? Jesus' is suffering and service That results in glory. How do we respond to it? Well, point three we're up to now, a wrong response. As we keep reading through the passage, we come to how his disciples responded. We'll read from verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons approached him with with her sons. She knelt down to ask him for something. What do you want? He asked her. Promise, she said to him, that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right and the other on your left in your kingdom. So Mrs. Zebedee brings her sons, James and John, to Jesus, and then they have this interesting little interchange. First, she kneels down, she shows respect, even reverence. Clearly, she's got some idea of who Jesus is, but not fully. She makes a request, and then Jesus asks this question, what do you want? He puts it out there an opportunity for him to serve, an opportunity for them to show where their hearts are at. What do you want? Now, what would your response be to that question? The saviour of the world, he's just finished explaining how he's going to suffer and die for you, and then he says, what do you want? Now, I reckon our response would probably be pretty similar to that of Mrs Zebedee. Promise that my boys will sit on either side of you in your kingdom. Give us the good position. Give us status. Give us worth by placing us in the power seats. Give us a reward for our efforts. Now, we often think like that, don't we? Jesus, do for me. Jesus, promise me. I want a reward. I want. I want. But Jesus' response now is absolutely wonderful. Verses 22, Jesus answered, You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? We are able, they said to him. He told them, You will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right and left is not mine to give. 
Instead, it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. Jesus basically says to them, you guys have no idea, do you? You don't know what you're asking. You don't know what I am about to suffer for you. I mean, that's what that symbol of the cup's all about. Jesus, The cup that Jesus will drink is suffering, extreme suffering, but it will be for the benefit of others. And he warns them, this will happen to you too. But they don't get it yet. So then, of course, the other disciples, you know, they catch on and they start arguing amongst themselves. They become indignant, meaning proud, competitive, you know, aspects of unfairness. Why should James and John get the power seat and not me? I've been working just as hard as them. Why don't I get reward for my effort? And then, you know, hold up a minute. Didn't Jesus just teach about the very ish- this very issue in a parable not long ago, the one we looked at last week? Have they not listened? Well, clearly, they haven't grasped who Jesus is yet or understood what he's taught. Greatness in the kingdom is not measured by works, but by service. This is something we too can get caught up on. When we think what I'm doing is what makes me worthwhile in the kingdom. You know, I read my Bible every day, I go to church, I, I give, I help out in this ministry. Surely all these things score me brownie points with God. Surely then I deserve a reward within the kingdom some recognition for my efforts, some sort of lofty status. Well, that's the way it works in the world, isn't it? It's what it tells us we need. Jesus points out how the world thinks about this, about status and power in verse 25. Jesus called them over and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in high positions act as tyrants over them. These examples are not spun positively, are they? Do note, though, Jesus isn't objecting to constituted authority here. It's the misuse of power that he's warning against, the abuse of power. Now, the disciples, they'd know about this sort of abuse of power. I mean, just think back to uh, Gentile rulers taking Jews into exile. You've got Herod, who murdered infant baby boys. You've got Herod Antipas, who killed John the Baptist. You remember in verse 18, who Jesus said he was going to be handed over to. Power positions, authority, status are not to be the hallmarks of the kingdom of God. Look at what Jesus says are the hallmarks in verse 26 to 27. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. And Jesus says it very clearly. It must not be like that among you. It must not. That's definite. Don't be like them. Stop trying to grab greatness for yourself. If you're in the kingdom, don't be like that. To be in the kingdom is not to be independent. To be in the kingdom is to be dependent on the one that's brought you in. Jesus unpacks that in verses 26 and 27, which is another another modification back in chapter 19, verse 30, which said, but many who are first will be last and the last first. Now it's whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. So you want the power, you want the greatness? Well, then give it up. Become like a servant. Give up your selfish desires and ambitions and become dependent on the one who's brought you into the kingdom. I mean, remember uh, chapter 19, verse 24, classic verse. Take up your cross and follow me. Do as he does. We're up to point four. And we reach a part in the passage where it's almost like we've hit rewind. And we've gone back and we get this same pattern through again of here is the greatest and here is a response. So let's read verse 28. 
Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here's a reminder of who the greatest is. Jesus, the Son of Man, the Messiah who gave his life, who paid the ransom, the one who serves by dying in our place. This is the greatest. There's no greater act of service than this. Our response to that should not be to grab the power positions, to grab at the status with this, within his kingdom. Our response should be more like what we read about in the rest of the passage. I'm going to read 29 to 34 now. As they were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. There were two blind men sitting by the road. When they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd demanded that they keep quiet, but they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Jesus stopped, called them, and said, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, they said to him, Open our eyes. Moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes. Immediately they could see, and they followed him. So Jesus and the disciples, they're leaving Jericho. This is the last town before they hit Jerusalem. They're getting very close to the end now. And as they leave, there's these two blind men, outsiders. Now that outsider status, it's made obvious by the crowd, isn't it? Uh, The blind men call out and the crowd demand they keep quiet. But look at what they call out. Lord, have mercy on us. Have mercy. What a complete contrast. The disciples, James and John, Jesus' friends and followers, what was their cry? Can we have the best seats? Give us status. Where's the reward for my effort? And now we have two outsiders, shunned by the crowd, and their cry is have mercy on us. They seek mercy. They know they're sinners and they need Jesus to heal them. They cry out for mercy. What a great image is that? They don't cry out for their effort. And who do they cry for mercy from? The son of David. A title that's connected with his identity as the Messiah. A title that acknowledges who Jesus truly is. The greatest. And they call to him for mercy. So Jesus stops and he calls to them. Now, this wouldn't have been easy because you've got to remember at this time, lots of people are heading to Jerusalem. It's nearly Passover. And if you're heading to Jerusalem and you see Jesus walking along, you're going, oh, I've heard stories about him. You're going to start following this guy. You're going to want to see what goes down. So it would have been a massive crowd. But Jesus stops and he asks the blind men a question. He puts it to them. What do you want me to do for you? It's that same question he asked Mrs. Zebedee. But isn't their response interesting and specific? Open our eyes. They've humbly come before Jesus, acknowledging their broken state, and asked for him to heal them, to open their eyes. And Jesus has compassion. He touches their eyes and he heals them. He uses his power to heal these apparently quite unimportant blind men. Even the closeness of Jerusalem and the impending suffering he is going to endure does not stop him from continuing to serve others. The request of the disciples, that showed their blindness, that they didn't grasp who Jesus was yet what he was doing, what it meant to be in his kingdom. The request of the blind men showed their vision. They knew who Jesus was. They knew who they were. They cried out for mercy, and it was granted. And then they followed Jesus. Now, this can be taken literally. I mean, they can see now. So they get up and they walk. They physically follow. But it's more. Now they are followers of Jesus. They are in the kingdom. They were outsiders and they've been brought in. 
And so they follow the one who has saved them. So then how do we follow? What does it mean for us to follow? I think from this passage, there's four things to consider as we follow Jesus. The first, recognise who he is. He is the greatest in the kingdom. He is the one who paid for our ransom. He's the one who suffered, who was humiliated, brought to the lowest of the low, a servant, a slave, but who was raised by his father and seated on the throne. This is who we follow, and he is awesome. Second, we've got to listen to him. It amazes me as you look back over the chapters before this, how many times Jesus teaches essentially the same thing to his disciples. And again and again, they're hearing his words about what it means to be in the kingdom. But they continue to be concerned with themselves. Will their efforts be rewarded? We've actually got to listen to God's word and put it into action, which then leads on to the next two considerations. Third, if you're following him, you're in his kingdom, so don't be like the world. Remember the attitudes that were brought out in verse 25, the seeking of status, the abuse of power, doing for one's own self-worth, reward for effort. It must not be like that among you. Now, that's going to be hard because the world around us tells us all the time that that's how things work. That's how you get ahead. That's how you survive. It's how workplaces work. It's how school systems work. It's something that we are going to be exposed to and part of. But when it comes to kingdom things, we're not to be like that. Which brings us to the final point. What are we supposed to be? Servants. We're to serve others. As citizens of the kingdom, we are to follow the king. He served to bring others into the kingdom. He says, serve, so follow. We are to become like a servant to others. Now, that doesn't mean forced labour. Please don't hear me wrong there. I'm not saying forced labour. This means putting the needs of others before your own. Sacrificing for the good of others. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice as the greatest service we could ever know. So follow him, sacrifice and serve. So how do you serve? How can you serve? There are so many ways we can serve within the church. I mean, there's rostered roles in the service. There's maintenance and upkeep. There's just there's looking after each other, caring for each other's immediate needs, sickness, those that are in want. And that's just to name a few things. There's many, many ways that we can serve. How can you serve? But what about in other areas of life, like in our houses and our families? Husbands and wives, how how can you sacrifice to serve your spouse? Parents, how do you serve your kids? Kids. You heard a great few examples in the kids' talk this morning. How can you serve the rest of your family? What about employers? How can you serve your workers? Employees, how can you serve your boss? Now, I know lots of us already serve in church, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our community, and I'm really thankful to God for that. But we need to keep check of our hearts and our attitudes and motivations. Are we doing it out of selfish ambition to be known, to be acknowledged, to be rewarded for our efforts? Or are we serving because we are citizens of the kingdom who follow the king? Look to the example who came not to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Let's pray. Father, we cry out to you, have mercy on us. 
We are outsiders and we are unworthy. God, thank you so much for Jesus who came to serve, who gave his life as a ransom for us. Please open our eyes. Please help us to follow him. Amen.